gay marriage gives us a language that we haven't had previously to really talk about our relationships in a way that straight people understand the language too. So it's not perfect, but you know, now in a work setting, I can say, Oh yes, my, my spouse, my wife, you know, um, and people understand what that means, right? In black settings, you can now, you know, you can bring your, your spouse to the family barbecue and instead of people saying, Oh, is that your friend? You can say, well, actually, no, this is my spouse. Right. Um, So it was a way for Black queer women to be seen by other Black people in these settings. That was Siobhan Brooks, sociologist and professor of African-American studies at California State University, Fullerton. Siobhan is particularly well-known for her work in African-American sex workers. Much of her research has focused on the intersections of racial identity, gender, and sexuality— which is what we'll be discussing with her today, specifically exploring intersections between same-sex marriage and women of color. I think research has changed the world by helping us to ask questions about things we take for granted. I think that's a super interesting question, psychologically, but also sociologically. Every day, everywhere, some scientist is doing something that's just about to change the world. Welcome to How Researchers Change the World, a podcast series supported by Taylor & Francis, which will demonstrate the real-world relevance, value, and impact of academic research and highlight the people and stories behind the research. My name is Dr. Caitlin Regeer. I'm an academic researcher, an author, and a scholar of digital and modern culture. And I'm interested in how new technologies can broaden the reach and real-world impact of academic research. In today's episode, we're speaking with Siobhan Brooks and exploring her research into marriage and same-sex relationships amongst African Americans. Specifically, we'll be unpacking her 2017 paper, Black on Black Love, Black Lesbian and Bisexual Women, Marriage, and Symbolic Meaning. But before we do that, let's start at the beginning of her journey with why she decided to pursue a career in research in the first place. Siobhan's entry into becoming a researcher was, as she puts it herself, very unconventional. She was inspired to pursue a career as a sociologist because of her time at the Lusty Lady Club, She worked there during her undergraduate degree at San Francisco State University as a way to pay her fees. I was an exotic dancer at a time where it wasn't common, it wasn't popular for women to do that. But I got introduced into this, uh, ironically enough, through my feminist studies classes. And uh, it was a way that a lot of us felt we could supplement our financial aid. When Siobhan started working at The Lusty Lady, She was told she was not allowed to work in the club's private rooms, where dancers made the majority of their money. This, she was told, was because white men wouldn't pay to see black women dance. She was shocked that even in the exotic dance industry, there was such a huge gap between what white and black dancers could earn— It was this which sparked her desire to become a researcher and confront this disparity head on. People can see new dancers on the stage, but we also had at the time what was called like a private pleasures booth or some people call it like a VIP room today. And that is usually where women would make most of their money. And the club had a policy that was um, unwritten but spoken that uh, black dancers were not allowed to work in that part of the club because um, basically the argument was that white men wouldn't pay to see them because uh, on the stage you could just pay like maybe at the time a quarter, you know, but this started at $5, this um, private pleasures, uh, you know, VIP kind of component. You at least had to put like $5 in, you know, for a certain number of minutes. Um, You know, it was window separated by glass, all of that. So that really started at least on my end, my activism and, you know, I wrote a petition and 
you know, then other women, you know, started noticing other problems at the club. And so together we decided to unionize. Um, and then the, you know, owners of course made concessions, you know, uh, suddenly there was a array of, you know, diverse dancers, you know, in that part of the club. Um, but that I think was really what, um, prompted me to go into sociology actually, when I was, uh, finally in, in grad school and, and really look at, um, racial stratification, uh, you know, within the exotic dance industry, because I think most people aren't aware that, you know, wage disparity would, would go in every level of occupations, um, you know, including exotic dancing. I think most people think this is an, an area where, you know, you make money and, and that there are no barriers to you making money, but it, it's actually very similar to what we hear women of color experience in acting you know, Hollywood, you know, um, very similar type of uh, discrimination. At that time, the Lusty Lady was one of the most progressive strip clubs, which operated as a workers' co-op. It was managed by women, there was no customer contact, and it was considered to be a safe environment, with women escorted to their cars by support staff and a no-tolerance policy towards customers who were disrespectful or abusive to dancers. But for Siobhan, the way that the club engaged with its workers of color was a huge flaw in its identity as a feminist establishment. The management were deliberately limiting opportunities of their Black dancers to engage with customers, making it more difficult for them to gain customers and earn a fair living. Siobhan thought this was deeply unjust, and she wanted to do something about it. She began to share her story as a way to educate others about the disparities in wages between races. I started to educate, starting at San Francisco State and other colleges in the Bay Area, about wage disparity and racism in the exotic dance industry. And then when I was... Uh, doing this, I was asked to publish uh, in an anthology at the time. The title was was called War is Another Feminist, actually published by Routledge. And um, Jill Nagel at the time was the editor. And when I was doing a book reading from my chapter, I came across an anthropologist uh, at Modern Times Bookstore in San Francisco. Her name is France Windance Twine. She teaches at UC Santa Barbara. And she heard my story and she said, you know, I would really like to basically mentor you. you. You know, you should apply to grad school. And so that really started the ball rolling, you know, from a very unconventional uh, way of, of sort of entering academia. You know, I didn't have any intention of going to grad school at the time. I was 27. But I realized I really liked learning. I liked lecturing, which is what I was doing when I was doing these tours um, at different colleges to talk about what we were doing at the Lusty Lady, and I felt that it was it was it was time for me to go back. So that that is a sort of <laughs> roundaway answer of how I I became a researcher. Since then, Siobhan's research has become more centered around the intersections between African American studies, women's studies, and gender studies. She found that reading for her African-American studies classes was primarily focused on Black men, where reading for her women's studies classes was almost entirely about white women. Siobhan felt that no one was talking about or looking at race through the lens of gender and sexuality. My research pro projects are looking at how, how sexuality specifically informs race. Right. And and our experiences of race. Um, and so working at the Lusty Lady sort of coincided with what I was learning in my feminist studies classes. Ironically, we didn't read bell hooks in either black studies or women's studies. I, I think I stumbled upon her completely by accident. I was doing a research project on black slave uh, women and, and sort of, you know, um, you know, their position in, in you know, uh, society, slave society at the time. And I knew about Angela Davis and her, her, her work on that. But I came across Bell Hooks, um, you know, Ain't I a Woman? I was like, wow, I've never heard of her before, you know? For those of you who don't know, 
Bell Hooks is an American author, professor, feminist, and social activist. She's written extensively on the intersectionality of race, capitalism, and gender. Her first major work, Ain't I Woman, was published in 1981. It's widely recognized as being an influential contribution to feminist thought, looking at omissions of Black women within the traditional feminist writings. And she's been a major inspiration for Siabin. I think a lot of of these early experiences um, really framed the way in which I study race. Um, I would describe myself as sort of a non-conventional scholar in that sense when it comes to race. Um, and now there there are more people, I think, who are taking this approach. Like, you know, we have queer studies within African-American studies departments more and more. Um, we have scholars that are taking that approach more and more. Uh, a lot of queer Black scholars, specifically Black feminist scholars, um, who are doing a gender sexuality based approach in looking at race, um, which is different than just looking at race from like the labor market, right? Or race solely, you know, uh, vis-a-vis say, you know, white supremacy or, you know, all these things are of course there in my work. But um, now it's really exciting because I think, and this leads up to the article that I did, Black on Black Love. um, I think this is an exciting time for, interdisciplinary scholars such as myself. Um, Now, sexuality is really, I don't want to say a hot topic, but it is within ethnic studies. And it wasn't always. It definitely wasn't always. As you can probably tell, Siobhan is passionate about working in the gaps of existing scholarship. She began exploring the relationship between gender, sexuality, and race before it was on the research agenda in any substantive way. Her 2017 paper, Black on Black Love, Black Lesbian and Bisexual Women, Marriage and Symbolic Meaning, is no exception to this. Siobhan has become interested in discussions about gay marriage and particularly what Black women had to say on the topic. She felt that they weren't being included in the wider academic conversation and that they had a perspective and view that would be incredibly interesting to explore. So with the gay marriage debate, you know, you had these camps. One camp was um, framed largely by white middle class gay and lesbian people who were very much for gay marriage and, you know, full citizenship and, you know, benefits and such. And then you had another camp uh, that was made up of, you know, uh, critical, um, you know, white and, and black queer people that were very critical of gay marriage and felt that it was a way to assimilate. Um, it was a way to further, you know, uh, resource divides, um, with queer people of color and, and, uh, white queers. Um, it wasn't trans inclusive per se. Um, you know, there was a lot of critique about, you know, basically why would queer people want to be in an institution that, you know, supports patriarchy and, you know, ownership of land and all of these things. Right. And I knew from my own experience that gay marriage also meant something very different for some of us. Um, you know, and so what I wanted to do was, um, Ass and you know uh, at the kind of the at the heart of you know the time of when gay marriage was you know kind of just passed. What did this mean? And so um, I went to Los Angeles and I went to a couple of uh, Black lesbian meetup groups to meet people, and I um, met about you know twelve, maybe about twelve, fifteen women there who, who you know wanted to be interviewed. Join us after the short break to find out what Siobhan discovered during her interviews. How can I make sure my published research has an impact on the world? What do I do if I disagree with peer reviewer comments? What techniques can I employ to manage my time between teaching and research commitments? These are questions we hear all the time from researchers at different stages of their careers. 
and we wanted to help. So we've created two 12-week learning programs to support your research career. For early career researchers, we've covered the full process of publishing your research, from choosing a journal, to managing the review process, to boosting your personal profile after publication, and everything in between. For mid-career researchers, our program builds on your existing knowledge and experience of publishing research to make this process more efficient for you. We've also included plenty of advice on raising the impact of your research, including driving discoverability using keywords and how to work effectively with journalists. If you think this would benefit you, sign up to a learning program today at howresearchers.com slash learning dash programs. Before the break, Siobhan was about to tell us about the interviews she conducted for her 2017 research paper, Black on Black Love. Siobhan ended up interviewing nine African-American lesbians and one African-American bisexual woman from the Los Angeles area. Quickly, she began to see a common thread in many of their answers. Most of the women she interviewed discussed the importance of dating someone Black, of remaining within their community, and being committed to engaging with Black politics. I remember... Uh, one woman, um, you know, from actually, I think she was from Santa Barbara or had lived in Santa Barbara, um, saying that, you know, the models that she grew up with, with her father, the type of black women he dated weren't necessarily positive. So in her development, she kind of came away with this, uh, notion, you know, that, um, you know, to move up in society, to assimilate, you know, you should be with a white woman type thing. And I think for some of the women I interviewed, that was a theme. and the conscious choice of, of choosing a partner that's black and, and also marrying kind of symbolizes political commitment to blackness, right. In black spaces. And, and I also think that, you know, on top of being queer, you know, if you have an interracial relationship, that's going to be read very differently in some of these, you know, family settings, then maybe if you're with another black person, um, you know, people may not understand the relationship, but the, 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 at least the race piece is sort of something that is understood. Um, so that was definitely a theme and that stood out to me. Um, another theme from some of the women who are religious was really wanting to show up at their church as, as who they really are, you know? And, uh, one woman talked about, you know, uh, the challenges of trying to find a black church that would be accepting and all of this. And, you know, ultimately I think she found one, but you know, it, it was really around, um, religion, family, right. But also political sort of commitment to, um, to blackness, to, to black politics. And, and this isn't to say that black people who are not in relationships with black people don't have that commitment as well. But I think when it's, a black woman, another black woman, it just makes that legitimacy, right, in the larger community a little bit easier um, to have. So those were some patterns um, that I had noticed in my interviews, a strong desire to participate and continue a legacy of, of you know, black political engagement, right, that most black queer people, when we look at our history, have been erased from, right? Like I, I teach um, in the African-American studies department and, you know, most people have no idea who Baynard Rustin was, <laughs> right? Everybody knows who Dr. King was, but they don't know that his mentor was a black gay man who organized the March on Washington, right? So that was part of um, the theme of really wanting to be in that tradition, right? That tradition of black political engagement with, with the community issues. African-American lesbian relationships can be seen as a demonstration of a commitment to the Black community. It becomes almost a symbol of Black feminist pride. One of the interviewees, for instance, told Siobhan, I was raised by strong Black women. My grandmother was a nurse, 
at a time when not many women were. My mother was a teen when she had me, but I saw her working to support us. I see dating black women as an extension of strong black women. At the same time, the women Siabin interviewed also saw marriage as a way of gaining recognition for their relationship and publicizing their love for one another. In this instance, marriage demonstrates that a couple is in a committed and stable relationship, meaning that it can be perceived as more legitimate to family and friends within the community. Another interviewee, for instance, spoke of how her family began to take her relationship seriously only after she married her partner. When Donna and I got married, my family, while not totally supportive of my choices, at least took my relationship seriously. They were forced to. I think that marriage also forces lesbian couples to take their relationship seriously. Siabin tells us that in African-American communities, there's often a don't ask, don't tell policy when it comes to homosexuality. Even if you know someone in your family or community is gay, you would never say it in public situations. But marriage changes that. For a lot of us, it was a way to be seen by the larger Black community. And that was something understudied, right? So what I found in that, in that paper that I wrote was um, a, lot of, a lot of what gay marriage was for some Black uh, lesbian and bisexual women was a way to have racial subjectivity um, and cultural legitimacy in black heterosexual settings, right? So basically it was a way for them to um, be out, right? So, So before gay marriage, you know, a lot of queer couples you know, we, we always don't really know what the language is to describe ourselves, right? Um, oftentimes people say, oh, you know, is your friend coming, right? That was for years, <laughs> particularly in, in Black communities, what would be said, um, even if you knew someone was gay and you knew this was their partner, you know, oftentimes people would not refer to this individual as somebody's partner or lover, you know, or, you know let alone spouse. It would be, oh, is your friend coming, right? Um, it's a way for queer Black women to be seen. And so gay marriage gives us a language that we haven't had previously to really talk about our relationships in a way that straight people understand the language too. So it's not perfect. But, you know, now in a work setting, I can say, oh, yes, my, my spouse, my wife, you know, um, and people understand what that means, right? The wider importance of Siabin's research lies in its political significance and how we can write policy and create institutions that are inclusive and take into account the experience of women of color. I think it's important um, on a number of levels. I think in terms of just society, it's important um, when we're looking at families and when we're looking at policy, um, to really look at sort of what what are issues that are important to Black queer women specifically, right? Um, how are those issues different than mainstream gay and lesbian political organizing, right? Um, I think particularly with things like like marriage, you know, um, statistics show that overall Black people, right, um, have not economically benefited from marriage, <laughs> right? Um, a lot of Black heterosexual families are not heteronormative, right? Um, you have a lot of Black uh, single mother parenting in our communities, right? And so it shifts the, the framework. So what what's needed, right? So it, it turns into like um, what's needed in terms of resources for Black families, right? which includes queer black family formations. And then, so I think, so I think in the larger society, it's around policy, right? And then I think in terms of like individual and sort of like racial group significance, it's also around how have black queer people contributed to black societies, right? And black communities, right? How is the structure of black life and, you know, black families changing, 
right? Um, or are they changing? Is it just that we're seeing more visibility of these groups, right? And so I think that's important um, when we're looking at, you know, subjectivity, as I said earlier, um, Black queer people feeling included in Black communities, right? I think all of that is important in terms of when we're looking at, you know, our political stru- stru- you know, structures and, you know, how can we be more inclusive, even within our Black communities, right? Um, our Black colleges are just now having discussions, which are great, around, you know, queer, queer Black students at some of these Black colleges, particularly Black trans women at, you know, Spelman College, Black historical, Black, um, you know, liberal arts, women's college, right? That's great. That's great because it, it's, it's not just that it's the larger society and, you know, um, they have to sort of, you know, uh, you know, look at these issues, but it's also our resources and, and also how in black communities, how can we make our institutions that are for black people more inclusive as well? And Siobhan believes that some of this change is beginning to take shape. Film and television is one area that she finds promising in terms of its new representations of diversity. In terms of society, I think the media is interesting. I think we see the outcome of some of these social movements in media representation. And even though those media representations aren't perfect, um, they indicate sort of a desire of where the society wants to go on on some level. So there's more diversity in television than what I was growing up with, um, particularly around black queer images. Um, Moonlight was a wonderful film. Uh, Pose is great. Um, That definitely didn't exist when I was coming up. So I think that that is important in terms of representation. But That is by no means to say that her work in this area is done. Then again, we have a lot of work to do because while you have media representation, you still have a gap, right, of the people that are supposedly represented in the media being extremely disenfranchised, right? So while we have gay marriage and, you know, racial diversity in films more and television, you have a huge rate of LGBT young people, people of color committing suicide, right, in schools. Research has found that suicide and attempted suicide rates are significantly higher for both African-American and LGBT children. A 2011 study published in the American Journal of Public Health studied lesbian, gay, and bisexual people under the age of 24, the age by which most suicide attempts occur in the LGBT community. The research found that 19.5% of Black respondents had attempted suicide, compared to the 9.1% of white respondents. So I think there's still a lot of work to do with reforming K-12 education, right? I think think university is sort of where we've seen a lot of the um, social movements get institutionalized in an educational setting, but we haven't really seen that from K through 12, right? And I think that's really what we need to see um, because not everybody goes to college. You shouldn't have to wait to go to college um, before you start learning about yourself. You know what I mean? Um, Particularly when we look at suicide, some young people won't live long enough to go to college, you know? So I think that that's uh, still a lot of work that needs to be done. and, And definitely academics can be part of that. When it comes to the role of academics in changing this situation, Siobhan feels that the focus should be on bringing discussions of race and gender into mainstream schooling instead of keeping it on the outskirts. Specifically, she feels that subjects such as African-American studies and gender studies shouldn't be separated as areas of education or something you only discover when at university. Instead, these conversations should be interwoven amongst all levels of schooling and the whole education system. Definitely, you know, uh, queer studies and, you know, all the interdisciplinary um, departments and programs, ethnic studies, right, women's studies, um, 
needs to be supported by universities. And then I think in addition to that, a lot of these issues need to be in mainstream departments, right? Sociology, biology, um, you know, geography, <laughs> anthropology. Um, so I think just really diversifying these courses, the, you know, the, these, these subject matters um, throughout different disciplines is, is one way to get the research out there, right? At least within the university setting, because you're right, it is in academia, but even if we look at where it is in academia, it's not everywhere, right? Um, most of our classes, for instance, fall in GE, right? So students have to take, uh, you know, uh, general education requirements, you know, to graduate. And that's where they stumble upon ethnic studies, you know, queer studies, women's studies, and so forth. Um, but if you don't take those GE classes, then you can pretty much go in your college career not learning about these things, right? So I think that's still a struggle, right, is is how to not have these disciplines and these particular research topics marginalized even within academia. It's through making these areas of research more prominent and more accessible throughout education that will be the way forward. And that's exactly what Siobhan's own research has done and will continue to do. In the case of this research paper, it's about bringing the perspective of women of color into the wider conversation of gay marriage to acknowledge and understand the full picture— In a broader sense, her research sits at the intersection of issues and academic disciplines and brings together ideas and individuals to fill those gaps of knowledge. For Siobhan, this is the beauty of the research. I think research can change the world by opening up possibilities and connecting people. To find out more about this podcast and today's topic, visit howresearchers.com slash blacklove. We'd also love to hear your feedback on today's episode. You can leave us a review on your podcast provider or send us your thoughts on social media. Tag us on at howresearchers and use the hashtag howresearchers. In the next episode we'll be speaking to researcher Marco tabrumel Strout about active travel and the way types of transport impact the way we relate to other people and the environment around us. This podcast was written and produced by Manchu and recorded at Under the Apple Tree Studios. Our producers were Ryan Howe and Tabitha Whiting, with editing, mixing, and mastering by Miles myers Co. harris at WBBC. We would like to acknowledge the incredible support of Taylor and Francis Group with a special thank you to Elaine Devine and Claire Dodd. I'm Dr. Caitlin Regeer. Join us next time for How Researchers Change the World. Thanks for listening.